Uh, thanks for thanks for joining the aviation data science seminar today. Um, it's brought to you by Berkeley and NASA and NASA Academic Mission Services. Um, I'm just going to go through a few quick logistical notes, and Vish will go ahead and present our speaker for today. Um, just logistically, next week will be our last speaker for the semester. Um, for those of you who are taking the seminar as a course, we'll, we'll announce the end of semester assignment and all of its details next week. Um, and regarding questions during the talk, if there are any quick clarifying questions, please, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Otherwise, uh, we would like to take all the questions at the end. And during the presentation itself, please keep your mics muted. Um, and if you choose to, uh, your video off as well, just to make sure we have a good communication line. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Vish, who will introduce our speaker for today. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Pawan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this penultimate seminar. Um, it is with great pleasure and honor that I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gono Chatterjee. Um, Gono is a very good friend, colleague, and mentor for me at NASA Ames. Uh, he, has, he has been there for almost three decades and contributed to the field of air traffic management immensely. Uh, especially with focus on you know, machine learning, pattern recognition, and flight dynamics. Uh, all, most of the best simulators there at Ames, you know, pretty much Gono has a big part to play in it. Um, he, to just a quick background, he did his BTEC in IIT Kanpur in India and his master's in Mississippi and PhD from Santa Clara. Uh, trained as a mechanical engineer. I feel like, I mean, we should have had this talk a while earlier, but I guess later, but not never. So Gono, with that, I will hand over to you and enlighten us. <laughs> okay, hopefully this is gonna work. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with the, uh, you know, just a little bit about the roadmap of Internet of Things and beyond. So where we are and where we are headed. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, three different types of transportation systems, just to tell you that transportation systems are pretty similar in the way they behave and the controls that you apply. So you can actually borrow ideas from one type of transportation system and apply it to another one. Then I'll just briefly say that, you know, for air transportation, you know, we have used, um, it's, a, it's basically an area of multidisciplinary research. So we have uh, borrowed ideas from various domains uh, and applied it to air traffic control. Then I'll talk a little bit about the history of flight, uh, brief history of flight. I'll describe the national airspace system and talk about things that are really relevant to data science, which are the airspace geometry. So all the data associated with the airspace geometry is important. Uh, knowledge of federal uh, aviation regulations is important. Um, the, the understanding of what the air traffic controllers do, their roles, responsibilities, equipment that they use. Um, then I'll talk about wind and weather briefly, which is basically wind data is very important for trajectory prediction and things of that nature. And weather is severe weather is something that airplanes have to avoid. Um, then I'll briefly talk about uh, separation assurance, although there is a whole field which deals with separation assurance, but I'll just give you a very preliminary idea of what separation assurance is. And then uh, I'll talk about traffic flow management with a simple example, if I, can, if I get to there by the time the talk is done. <clears throat> okay, so currently we are, uh, we are in the mobile internet uh, uh, age in the sense that we can do streaming, we can do uh, voice over IP, we can do, uh, you know, uh, remote conferences, what we are doing now. So those kinds of things we can do today. We are moving towards internet of things, which is the urban air mobility or package delivery drones. So basically, uh, you know, you will have billions of connected smart devices, including your mobile phones, and you will have uh, machine to machine communications. It will be low latency and latency tolerant and security and reliability will be addressed. So that is what, where we are headed towards, or we are close to, that's what we are working on. So all the 5G technologies, 6G technologies, et cetera, they are all related to this. 
uh, the cloud folks are also focusing on the Internet of Things. And eventually we, we will be headed towards tactile internet. So what that means is somebody in Washington DC, you know, having a joystick or a controller and a robot in California, and the person will be able to get tactile feedback from the machine as the machine moves, he'll be able to feel on his joystick what the, uh, you know, whether the surface is rough or smooth. So that will be basically human to machine inter interaction. Okay. So, there are three transportation systems that I'm just briefly going to talk about. So there is air traffic, there is highway traffic, there is data traffic. So you have the notions of origin, destination, source node, destination node. Of course, the speeds are quite different. Uh, in the air, air, air traffic, you're going at approximately 50, 500 miles per hour. Highway traffic, you know, 65 to 70 miles per hour. And of course, the data traffic, you're going at speed of light. And you have the notion of routing. So in the air traffic or highway traffic, you know, uh, from one uh, route segment or the highway segment to another highway segment, the driver actually switches it. In a data traffic, you have a router that switches it. You have ideas of uh, physical things that transport. So for example, you have airspace, you have road segments, you have links. There is network topology, road topology, airspace layout. And of course, there are vehicles and there is this notion of route that you're following. So this is a, there's a flight plan, a route. And of course, in the data traffic also, there is route. Then you have notions of capacity and bandwidth. You have also transit time, trip time, processing time. And of course, you apply these kinds of controls like metering and routing. And even in data traffic, the notions of metering and, and rerouting are applied. So basically when there is congestion, there is something called transfer control protocol, TCP, which actually throttles back to, to slow down the traffic when, uh, when there is congestion. And then of course you have uh, notions of delay and in, in your package traffic, you also have notions of delay and packet loss. So by showing you that these systems are pretty common, you can actually take ideas from one area and other, uh, into another area. I've actually taken ideas from air traffic and I've applied it on package traffic also. Okay, so the purpose of data science and air traffic is principally, it actually behaves like a control system. So there is an objective that you're trying to meet. meet. So for example, you want to reduce delay or you want to, uh, you want to increase throughput. Uh, so that is your objective. Then you have a decision support system, which is like a controller. And uh, the, then you basically do some action. So either you communicate by voice and then the pilot flies it or, or, or you instruct the machine and the machine does something. And then of course the plant or the process is the air traffic control system that changes. So for example, aircraft are either slowing down or they are sitting on the ground or they are moving. So that affects the, the air traffic. And then of course you need to have some sensors, which is like radars or uh, some sort of a communication mechanism so that you can collect the data about what is going on. And then the estimation is essentially estimation or prediction is something that you you do so for example you see an airplane at one location and you say in the next 15 minutes where where is it going to be so you predict that similarly if there is weather somewhere you say how is this weather moving and where, where will uh, this weather be at uh, in the next 15 minutes or 20 minutes and then of course decision support so most of the data science is basically applied to the decision support function prediction function sensors and also a little bit into the actuation part. So actuation part is, for example, what was commanded and what was actually implemented. So if there is a discrepancy between those, um, especially during accidents and incidents, you use data science to actually investigate some of those things. So air traffic management, when I talk about air traffic management, there are basically two components to it. One is called air traffic control and the other is called traffic flow management. Okay. So why is ATM challenging? It is challenging because of data complexity. So you have a whole bunch of data, flight data, radar data, geometric data, wind data, weather data. And then on top of that, you have different models or aircraft models that you use to predict, uh, predict uh, trajectory, for example. 
So those, so flight data, radar data, geometric data, wind data, weather data, models, these are the kinds of things. These are the primary inputs for your uh, data science uh, uh, algorithms. Of course, there is, uh, the, then there is interaction complexity. You have human to human communication. You have human to machine communication. You have to machine, you have machine to machine communication. Then you have communication complexity, you have wireless, radio-based, and then you have, uh, so you have both wireless and wired voice and digital communication with the aircraft and geographically distributed sensors and decision support systems. So you have got computers, you have got basically sensors, and of course, uh, governing regulations and directives. So there are letters of agreements, there is standard operating procedures, all those things have to be followed. Um, and later on, I'll talk briefly about the regulations. Of course, there is complex infrastructure, you have radar systems, other kinds of uh, dependent surveillance systems, you have radio beacons, you have landing systems, lighting systems, computer systems. And of course, uh, you have uncertainties, you have weather, wind, severe weather, fog, then you have equipment failure, you have airline, um, airline issues, so for example, the baggage gets stuck somewhere or the passenger doesn't show up or the pilot is on a different flight and is going to show up. And then you have uh, emergencies, the patient suddenly falls sick or something like that. So all those things the system has to deal with. And then there is operational complexity, like you, you have to deal with safety, efficiency, fairness. So you, you don't want to give preference to one airline as opposed to another one. So the FAA has to worry about those kinds of things. Then there is a certain quality expectation. So when you take off, you're supposed to land and you're supposed to get there in a certain, a certain amount of time. So quality assurance has to be guaranteed in some sense. And then there are multiple stakeholders in the system and they have got diverse different needs. Then of course you have certification requirements and FAA also has the responsibility for advocacy for air traffic. So it is multiple, multi, multidisciplinary research. Uh, you know, we use ideas from dynamics, estimation, guidance, navigation, control, operations research, queuing theory, optimization methods, communication networks. Uh, we, we have used notions of control plane, which is like route com compute, and uh, data plane, which is like switching type of models. We have used ideas from highway transportation, computer science, like networks, graph theory, databases. Uh, computer vision, machine intelligence, robotics. Uh, so for example, for computer vision, if you look at weather, you know, you can think of it as an image and you can use the same kinds of ideas that people use in computer vision to process some of that data. Uh, hybrid systems, because uh, there are continuous modes and then there are discrete modes. You can use ideas from fluid mechanics, like for example, if you want to avoid a certain area of weather, you can solve the Laplace equation to compute, for example, streamlines, which is a representation of a route. And then people have used ideas about like Lagrangian models, Eulerian models. Then of course you can use ideas from economics like Pareto optimal and things of that nature, management. Uh, so basically from multiple domains, you use ideas for, for air traffic uh, management, okay. So now uh, this is a picture of uh, Archie William League at Lewis Lambert Municipal Airport uh, in 1929. He was the first air traffic controller. He was a pilot, an engine, and an aircraft mechanic. So basically early morning, he would go with his, uh, this uh, wheelbarrow with two flags, a chair, and an umbrella. He would sit at one end of the runway, and he had two flags in his hand. One was a red flag for holding position. The other was a checkered flag. He would wave it for the airplane to come and land. He had a degree in aero engineering from Washington State in St. Louis, and he retired as assistant administrator of the FAA. So from the humble beginnings, this is where the air traffic system kind of evolved from those humble beginnings. Okay. So history of flight in 1903, right flyer flew. It flew for 12 seconds, and it flew a distance of 37 meters. The Air Mail Act of 1925, it allowed the Postmaster General to contact um, private companies for uh, transporting mail. Boeing, Douglas, Pratt & Whitney uh, were born during that time. Then in 1926 to 34, Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic. His aircraft was called Ryan NYP. NYP is for New York to Paris. 
During this time, a two-way radio and radio equipped control tower was, uh, was, uh, was invented and Colonial, which is American Western Express, TWA, Northwest and United were formed. 1934 to 55, Bureau of Air Commerce interline agreements were formed to coordinate air traffic in Newark, Chicago, and Cleveland. They were afraid that airplanes would run into each other, so they formed interline agreements, and that is the, really the beginning of air traffic control. Civil Aeronautics Administration was formed in 1940. Visual flight rules and instrument flight rules were, uh, were uh, uh, initiated, and I'll talk a little bit about the visual flight rules and instrument flight rules. English was adopted as the common air traffic control language and International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, was formed. An instrument landing system was developed to assist aircraft landing uh, on at least the major airports. 1955 to 65, VORTAC, which is called the Very High Frequency Omni Range and TACAN. TACAN is a, a, a military system, and this is basically a radio beacon system that aircraft with equipment on board can follow. Then the Air Route Surveillance Radar, which is ASR, AR, SR was developed and air traffic control uh, compu computers uh, installed at the Indy Center. Uh, air traffic control radar beacon system, which is called ATCRBS. This is a long range radar. This was developed and the commercial jet aircraft was also uh, developed during uh, this uh, era. Separation standards and sectors were developed. Sector is a smaller area of airspace, and I'll talk about it a bit later. And Federal Aviation Agency was created in 1958. The Department of Transportation, DOT, was created in 1967, and Federal Agency was brought under the DOT as Federal Aviation Administration. The National Transportation Safety Board, which is called NTSB, was created to investigate transportation accidents and radar data processing, uh, RDP was developed. So the flight data processing, which was the, which is the, uh, which is called the FDP and FDP and the RDP became part of the host computer. So this was the IBM 360 host computer uh, for processing all the radar data and the flight data. <clears throat> Automated radar terminal system, ARTS uh, was actually uh, create, developed and the en route arts was also developed. This is the TRACON system, which is the terminal radar approach control, which is the terminal area. So when the, these are near the airports. The Airline Deregulation Act uh, of 1978 that allowed the airlines to form hub and spoke type of operations. And the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Association, PATCO, uh, went on a strike in 1981 and President Reagan actually fired a large number of controllers during this, uh, this period of time. And then in 1987, the current uh, National Air Traffic Controllers Association, NATCA, was, was uh, formed. Okay, so this shows the, these graphs show the uh, air traffic activity between 1960 and uh, 2010. So the black line on top actually shows you the number of operations, which is the sum of uh, arrivals and departures. And you see this big dip around 1981. And then you see the blue line, which is the number of aircraft that, that were handled in the, uh, in the centers, which is in the airspace. This other purple line basically shows the flight services that were used and as you know, uh, people have electronic flight bags and other ways of getting weather information. The demand for flight services has kind of continued to go down. Okay, so you can see that uh, you know, in one year, of course, uh, you know, part of the reason for this is also people, uh, you know, bigger jets being introduced. So you can see about in one year, you have approximately like 50 million takeoffs and landings in 2010. Hey, Dano. Yeah. Kirsten, I just wanted to tell you that um, we just got the stats for um, air traffic right now during the COVID pandemic. Um, it's down 97% um, of, and we're down to, I'm sorry, 1954 levels of air traffic. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to tell you that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, 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 I would yes. suspect that. Okay, I believe so that passengers, not uh, flights, though. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Passengers, not flights. We're down sixty-seven percent in flights, I believe. 
Okay, so the, when people talk about national airspace system, uh, they mean like it's a network of airspace, air navigation facilities, equipment, services, airports, aeronautical charts, uh, information services, rules and regulations, uh, technical information, personnel. Um, and the, it includes, uh, so basically in the NAS, uh, the NAS system also shares components jointly with the military. There are over uh, 609,000 active pilots in the United States, and they operate more than 280,000 aircraft. And this is from uh, anything from a large commercial aircraft to small airplanes, to helicopters, gliders, balloons, and experimental aircraft. Okay, so these are 5,233 public use airports. And uh, you can see they are spread all, all across the United States. There are IFR airports. So these airports can support low visibility uh, landing and takeoffs. Then there are VFR airports, which means that only uh, good weather, proper visibility conditions, uh, you know, you can land at those airports. And then there are VFR landing facilities, which include heliports and things like that. So all these airports, uh, you know, for urban air mobility, you could use, uh, you know, uh, a lot of these, um, Public use airports, and of course, you see that uh, there's a lot more co concentration in the in the east compared to the west. Okay, so there are uh, about like nineteen about twenty thousand airports in the U.S., which includes the military and private fields. Public use, like I just showed you, about five thousand of those. The private use are approximately fifteen thousand, and then there are certified airports. Uh, about 604 uh, certified airports. So certified airports means that they can uh, they can support air carrier operations, which means aircraft with uh, more than nine passenger seats. So these are called the FAR, which is the Federal Aviation Regulation Part 139 operations. So these 604 civil airports can support uh, a bit uh, larger aircraft uh, landings and takeoffs. Okay. So the air traffic control system, uh, you know, consists of uh, several facilities. So the ATCT is the air traffic control tower. That is that flight originates. It goes through the terminal radar approach control area, which is the TRACON. Um, uh, for uh, so arrival, arriving and departing aircraft go through this airspace as they climb to the en route airspace, and during that time they talk to the TRACON controllers. Then they go through the, the en route airspace, they go through the RTC, which is the air route traffic, uh, uh, air, uh, which is the uh, air, air traffic control, no, air route traffic control se center. And then again, they go through TRACON and the air traffic control tra tower. So this uh, air traffic control system command center is kind of, uh, is, it coordinates with all these different uh, entities. So you have air traffic control tower, then you have the TRACON terminal radar approach control, then you have the air route traffic control center, then you, again, it goes through TRACON and the, um, and lands again at the, uh, uh, at the airport and while it is, uh, and during that time it talks to the tower controllers. Okay. So these are the different types of air traffic control facilities. You have flight service facilities. These are 76 uh, flight service stations. And these are under contract uh, with Lidos. So initially the contract was with Lockheed Martin. So these guys actually provide uh, weather information. So pilots uh, on the ground and in flight can actually call them and they can also submit their flight plans through these uh, flight service stations. So uh, the terminal facilities uh, that I just talked about, which are like, there are 517 air traffic control towers. There are 185 terminal radar approach controls for uh, in the terminal area for supporting terminal area traffic. And the en route facilities, there are 21 air route traffic control centers and three combined center and uh, radar approach control. These are called CRAPs. And uh, there is one air traffic control system command center. It is located in uh, Warrington, Warrington, Washington, uh, in uh, Virginia. Okay, so this is the US airspace. So essentially, like I said, these are the 21 centers. So Oakland Center uh, is basically the one that serves the Bay Area. Then you have the Los Angeles Center here. 
this is the Fort Worth Center. And so these are the 21 centers. And this Anchorage is also uh, artsy. The Honolulu, Guam, and San Juan, these are CRAPs, uh, which, which basically, uh, hmm, I don't know why I can't see that. Okay. The, so these regions inside the Fort Worth uh, Center that I'm showing, these are called sectors. So the, the RC airspace is essentially partitioned into sectors. And, and inside these sectors, so basically the air traffic as it flies through the sectors, they are controlled by sector controllers. So the sector controllers control traffic and they hand over uh, traffic as they transition through the different centers as they go across the, uh, through the different sectors as they go across the centers. Okay, and the sectors are, are, are basically partitioned at, into three levels. So these are low sectors, which go up to 24,000 feet altitude. The high sectors begin at 24,000 feet altitude and go up to 33,000 feet altitude. And the super high sectors go above 33,000 uh, feet altitude and they go up to 60,000 feet altitude. And inside the low altitude sectors, you have approach control areas and you have VFR tower or uncontrolled areas. So these regions like the box and the cylinder shows, those are the terminal areas. So airplanes you know, fly through the low sector and then eventually go inside this uh, approach control areas and land, they take off and leave these approach control areas and then go into the low sectors and the high sectors and super high sectors. And, and air traffic controllers work in all these areas. Okay. So these are high altitude jet routes. So they are like the highway. So you can, uh, I talked about the uh, commonality between transportation systems. So these are jet routes. Uh, these are high altitude jet routes and there are lower altitude Victor airways. And you can see that there are some gaps. Uh, you see some gaps and these are basically areas. These are special use airspace. Uh, this area is closer to the Edwards Air Force Base. So you cannot fly over it. So there are many places in, in the US where you cannot fly over, especially if they're activated or they are, when they're active. And I'll show you the special use airspace in the US, uh, one of the pictures. Okay, all right. So this, this is a bit more detail inside the airspace. So this is the Oakland Center uh, airspace. And these are, so for example, J32, J84, J110, J, 501, these are all airways. So you can think of them like uh, Highway 101 or 280. And these are either uh, radio beacons like MVA uh, or, or Sacramento. Uh, this is Oakland uh, Airport. So these are either air, uh, these are um, either navids or they are fixes or, or, or they could be intersections of airways. So these are well-defined locations that you can put into your flight plan. And that, will, uh, so basically the computer system, system can accurately parse and say uh, where this airplane is flying. So like, for example, uh, this is when you put it into, a, into, your, um, into your phone navigation system, you have a route. So this is like a route. And uh, these are, uh, this, this is like, this shows a detailed view of, of, of the route. Okay, so governing regulations. So code, there's something called Code of, of Federal Regulations, CFRs. These are the general and permanent rules published in the Federal Register by the executive departments and agencies of the federal government. It's divided into 50 titles. So Title 14 covers the aeronautics and space, and it includes numer numerous parts, also known as FARs, Federal Aviation Regulations. Uh, some examples are part one, which is the definition. So it defines everything. Part 71 is the designation of classes and of airspace. And I'll talk briefly about that. Then there is part 73, which talks about special use airspace that I mentioned briefly. Then there is part 91, which talks about general uh, operating and flight rules. There is part 121, which is the op operating rules for domestic flag and supplemental operations. So these are the large carriers like uh, American and United, Delta, Southwest. 
And then there is part 135, which is operating requirements for computer and on-demand operations. So for example, if you talk about urban air mobility type of an aircraft, then uh, part 135 type of regulations would be applicable. Okay, so this is uh, part 91, which is the general operating and flight rules. So here I've highlighted two of them, the visual flight rules and the instrument flight rules. So visual flight rules, for example, it says fuel requirements for flight in the VFR conditions. VFR flight plan, so information required, basic VFR weather minimums. So you can only operate a VFR flight if the weather uh, and the visibility is, is of a certain uh, kind. So basically, if you cannot, if the visibility is poor, you cannot do visual flight, you cannot fly under visual flight rules. Similarly, there are instrument flight rules, fuel requirements. Uh, you require a flight plan. Uh, VOR equipment check for, for instrument flight rules, air traffic clearance is required. So, uh, so basically 14 CFR part 91 describes the details of what they should be or what they, what they are. Okay, this is the airspace classification. This is uh, 14 CFR part 71. So the airspace is divided into class A, B, C, D, E, and G. So class A is 18,000 feet above mean sea level, up to flight level six, six, uh, 600, which means 60,000 feet altitude. Then you have class B, class C, and class D, which are basically uh, terminal areas. So uh, class B is around big, large airports in the US. So if you look at the 30 core airports, uh, class B airspace is around that. It's typically up to 10,000 feet above ground level. Class C is up to like 4,000 4, feet, feet above, uh, above ground level, and Class D is about uh, 2,500 uh, feet above ground level. And Class G can go up to 14,500 feet uh, mean sea level, but it de depends in different places. It could be 700 feet above ground level or 1,200 feet ground level. So class G is the uncontrolled airspace. So this is the airspace that uh, the new entrants would uh, fly through. And most, most of it is located in the Western US. So um, these are the uh, basically conditions for the different uh, airspace classifications. So for example, in class A, you can only do instrument flight rules in class B, C, D, and E and F, you can do both instrument flight rules and visual flight rules. The visibility is not applicable because this guy can fly in zero visibility conditions, but the other, others in B, C, uh, D, E, you require three miles visibility. Uh, in class G, you require one mile visibility. Uh, and then uh, you require a clearance in class A, class B, uh, class C, D, and E, you require clearance if you are instrument flight rules. Uh, in class G, you do, not, you do not require any clearance. Similarly, there are, uh, you know, it tells you that whether you re need radio or not. So for example, in class G, you don't need radio communications with the, with the ATC. Okay, so these are the special use airspace spaces in the United States. And uh, they are not active all the, all the time. So um, they include restricted airspace, they include uh, military operations areas um, and things of that nature. So this is uh, like, for example, around here, you have Edwards Air Force Base. Out here, you have Kennedy uh, Space Center. So if there's a launch, launch taking place, it will kind of, uh, this, this, this will be active. Similarly, you have, you know, you cannot fly over the White House, you cannot fly over the Capitol building, and, and you cannot fly over certain areas in the Great Lakes because of environmental uh, uh, constraints. So a lot of airspace, if everything was active, you know, you, you, you would, you, would uh, you know, your, your, uh, your flight routes would be more constrained. So some of the patterns that you observe there is also driven by these, uh, these uh, reserved and restricted airspaces. Okay, so this is 14 CFR part 73. They are all, all, all listed in there. Okay, so visual flight rules. This is 14 CFR part 91, which says the flight plan is optional. 
Radio contact with ATC is voluntary, except in class B, C, and D airspace. Pilot must see and avoid, and can only fly in good visibility, uh, and has to remain clear of clouds. VFR cloud clearance and visibility minimums vary with the type of airspace. So basically, I, I showed you either three miles or one mile. Okay. Instrument flight rules, this is 14 CFR part 91. Flight plan is required. Contact with ATC is mandatory. Separation with other traffic. Uh, so ATC separates the IFR aircraft from other IFR aircraft and IFR aircraft from VFR aircraft. But they will not separate VFR aircraft from VFR aircraft. Uh, they can fly in instrument meteorological conditions. So basically, if you have zero visibility, uh, you can fly the airplane just with instruments. The IFR clearance uh, is required for operating in class A airspace, which is uh, above 18,000 feet altitude. Okay, so flight plan says that uh, you have to provide the description of the flight, which is the call sign, the aircraft type, cruise speed, cruise altitude. You have to provide the origin and destination. You have to provide the procedure that you are going to use. So basically procedure means the route that you are going to use to depart the, uh, the airport. You have to provide airways, waypoints, fixes, navigates, intersections, fixed radial distance, which is basically like a distance and a radial from a known location to describe your route. And then you have to also uh, provide the, uh, the arrival route that you're going to use for landing at the, uh, at the arrival airport. So this is a flight plan. This is a, a form in which you file the flight plan. So here you show, you mark whether it is a VFR, IFR flight. Then this says, it's, this is American Airlines 278. It's a Boeing 767. The R says that it is capable of area navigation. It's going to fly a true airspeed of 468 knots. It's going to take off from, from Dallas-Fort Worth. And it's going to leave at 1909 Zulu and it's going to fly an uh, altitude of 33,000 feet altitude. It is headed for Washington, Dulles. It's going to take three hours and 15 minutes. That's the estimated time en route. And it has got fuel for four hours and 30 minutes. So basically it is compliant with all the regulations. And it, the alternative airport is JFK. So if there is some bad condition in Dulles, it's going to fly to JFK. So it needs to carry fuel all the way from DFW to Washington, to and from Washington to JFK, plus 45 minutes of additional en route fuel. So this is what a flight plan looks like. And then the weather briefing, so there are these flight service stations that I've talked about, 76 of those, they will provide aviation weather reports, forecasts and advisories to the pilot, all the notice to airmen, uh, for example, of whatever conditions are there in the airspace, uh, will be provided to the pilot when they call them. Uh, they, they can also take your flight plan and file it for you, and, and you can get all this information through in-flight services via, via radio communications. The National Weather Service also provides weather information, so that's uh, weather.gov. 1800weatherbriefing.com is another place where you can get, uh, this is actually uh, provided by LIDOS, and then there is aviationweather.gov that you can get information from, and also these days, using iPads and Android-based electronic flight bags, you can get weather information. Okay, so the diff different types of ATC equipment that is used, you have airport surface detection equipment, that's actually a radar-based system for the airport surface. It detects where aircraft is, and it can track as the aircraft taxi uh, and from the gate to the, to the runway and takeoff. There is airport surveillance radar. This is like a spinning radar. You see some uh, near, near airports. This is basically a TRACON radar. Then you have the air traffic control radar beacon system. This is, a, it has a primary radar and a secondary beacon system. And this is basically the long range radar, automated radar terminal system. This is the uh, TRACON computer. It's called ARTS. And then there is the ERAM, which is the en route automation modernization. This is again a computer system. This is used in the, uh, Air route traffic control center. Then there is direct uh, access radar channel, which is basically just takes the raw radar data and displays it for, for you if basically the computer systems fail. So this is the backup. Then the Omni, uh, very high frequency Omni range. This is a radio beacon 
I talked about TACAN, which is the tactical air navigation system. This is a military uh, system and the VORs and the TACANs are co-located uh, in several places and that system is called uh, VORTAC. Then you have air aircraft communications addressing and reporting system, which is called ACARS, which is an email type of a system. It's a digital link by which you can send messages from the ground to the airplane and from the airplane to the ground. And then there is voice communication. This is called a party line, so it is open, so all pilots can hear when, when, when the air traffic controller communicates with one pilot, other pilots can hear. So this helps with the situational awareness. Okay, so this is the different, all the uh, different kinds of data, uh, you know, uh, uh, or part of the data that is generated in the system. And a lot of this data is provided um, via the swim feed that uh, if you remember, uh, Dr. Jeremy Coop, you know, mentioned in his talk about swim, swim data. So a lot of the data produced by these systems is fed for, uh, for uh, consumption by the public and the uh, other stakeholders. Okay, so, so air traffic con uh, control tower, they basically use the, uh, uh, the uh, ASD feed, um, so which is, the, uh, uh, which is the airport surface detection equipment. And then the airport surveillance radar that uh, that gets position data from the it tracks the aircraft and feeds the position data to the tracons. The long range radar, uh, the air route surveillance radar that uh, gets uh, that feeds uh, position data into the uh, air route traffic control uh, center. So the ERAM gets data from uh, uh, the long range radar and the airport surveillance radar provides data to the um, to the Dracon system. Okay, so basically, once you get all the position data, you process it, and with the so the uh, so the ERAM and ARTS computers essentially process uh, all the uh, raw radar data, and they compute the latitude, longitude, altitude, ground speed, heading, rate of climb, descent for every aircraft in the system. So this is another set of data that you use for uh, for data science. Okay, so when the aircraft flies, there are basically four types of people who essentially communicate with each other to manage the aircraft. So the controller talks to the pilot and the pilot talks to the controller. So that is the air traffic control part. Then there is a traffic flow manager who talks to the controller and make sure that the controller is not overwhelmed by traffic. So he actually applies different kinds of traffic flow management initiatives. He also talks to the dispatcher, who is the airline representative, who essentially communicates with the pilot and gives some information about weather, et cetera. So when the airplane, so the pilot is kind of flying the airplane, the controller is making sure that the, he doesn't run into any other aircraft. Dispatcher makes sure that uh, you know, the, the schedule is maintained and make sure that assists the pilot with maintenance issues, answers questions uh, in flight. And he also talks to the traffic flow manage, uh, manager based on whatever concerns he has. And the traffic flow manager talks to the controller, make sure that the controller is not overwhelmed. So traffic uh, flow management and, and air traffic controller are, are parts of the Federal Aviation Administration and airline operations control part basically includes the pilot and the dispatcher. Okay, so airline operations control uh, has different functions that they do. And again, a lot of it, they do a lot of data science also. So they develop the schedule, which is the main uh, product of the airline. So in the, in the community, say, they say that the pilot flies an airplane, the dispatcher flies the schedule. Uh, they do flight planning. So they figure out the most efficient route of flight. They figure out alternative airports. They compute the amount of fuel required, the weight and the balance of the airplane. They, uh, you know, they keep track of maintenance requirements. So you are going to change the tires here and you are going to look at the, uh, you're going to change the seats there. Um, uh, and there, you are going to inspect the airframe at some other location. So they plan all that. And then there is a minimum equipment list requirement, which says that, for example, if you do not, if, if, if you have two oxygen canisters and one of them is not working, then you cannot fly at a certain altitude. You have to fly below a certain altitude. So they have to make sure that they comply with all the regulations. And then of course, they have to uh, manage the, uh, the, they have to manage the resources, which is the aircraft, the crew, 
and the passengers, they get together at one point and then they all go away at another location, right? So you have a uh, pilot coming on one flight, he comes and lands and gets onto another airplane and then uh, you know, flies that airplane uh, and so on and so, so forth. They also do flight fl following. So as the airplane flies through the airspace, they follow it using their displays and they advise uh, air crew with different options, gate availability, um, gate changes, all those kinds of information they provide. And they also separate the aircraft from weather. And if the pilot experiences turbulence or something, he will consult the dispatcher to see if the turbulence is going to go away or not and, and things of that nature. Okay, so air traffic controllers, there are uh, tower controllers, there are tracon controllers, and there are center controllers. So there are at the tower, you have clearance delivery, you have ground controller, you have local controller. And basically, uh, so the ground controller actually instructs the pilot to taxi to the active runway and the local controller sequences the flight into the local flow and make sure that the aircraft is separated from inbound and outbound traffic. The tracon controller, you know, he, he receives traffic from local controller and he flies the airplane through the tracon and, the, and then hold, and hands it off to the, to, the, uh, to the center controller. So this is a flight progress strip that they use. So flight progress strip has information like aircraft identification, type of aircraft, says a certain kind of, uh, so this one has a collision avoidance equipment, which is TCAS, the computer identification, proposed departure time, requested altitude, and remarks and basically they write on the paper strips they they write so this is this used to be the ultimate backup in case of radar failure or something they would still keep the information if the computer system failed uh, they, they would still be able to track it and 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 know where the airplane was okay so the center controllers you have a radar controller there's a r side that's the radar controller then there is an assistant controller a d side and there is a controller tracker. So the radar controller is the one who basically looks at the plan view display and sort of separates aircraft. Um, the assistant controller, he updates the flight process uh, progress strips that I just showed you and provides separation under non-radar environment. Then uh, you have the traffic management unit and this guy ensures that the sector controller's workload stays within limits and coordinates traffic flow management with the neighboring uh, centers and he uses the traffic flow management system which is a which is a computer-based system for demand prediction to make sure that the traffic controller would not be overwhelmed and he places a restriction to hold aircraft on the ground or to uh, put miles and trail type of restriction to to uh, slow down the um, the inbound traffic into into a sector Okay, so ATM provides two types of services, primarily safety and efficiency. So the air route traffic control center, it ensures that the IFR aircraft are separated and it ensures that the throughput is maintained. The central flow control maintains uh, safety and efficiency by uh, preventing congestion and they coordinate the actions of the different um, air route traffic control centers to make sure that the na national flow, which is the flow of traffic in the U in the U.S. is basically uh, safe and efficient. Okay, so for separation, aircraft have to be separated uh, both in altitude and and laterally. So either they have to be separated by five miles or by thousand feet. So there is uh, you you know you can be separated by three miles if the aircraft is within forty nautical miles from an antenna or when using a single non-mosaic radar source. So usually an aircraft is tracked by several radars and then ERAM uh, or ARTS, would, uh, ERAM would actually fuse that data and, and sort of say that, okay, this is where the aircraft is. So if the aircraft is observable from a single uh, radar and he's within 40 nautical miles, then you can have a three mile uh, lateral separation. Okay, and this is based on the um, FAA, um, the FA order uh, 7110.65, which is basically the air traffic control controllers manual. <clears throat> okay, so conflict detection methods, you can, uh, you can resolve aircraft through altitude control, you can command the aircraft to climb or descend. So vector means you ask the aircraft to change heading, like change heading by 30 degrees. Um, 
uh, and then speed control is you can ask one of the aircraft to speed up or slow down to separate. And of course, you can use combinations of these, con uh, these controls, right? So although I've just stated, it looks quite simple but, and straightforward, but that's not really the case. There is a whole plethora of literature which describes how to actually detect conflicts and how to resolve, because part of the problem is you have to use wind and weather to essentially predict where the aircraft is. You have to use the aircraft performance model to predict where the aircraft is, detect it, and then you have to actually do trial planning to ensure that the conflict is really resolved, and then you communicate that to the, um, that to the pilot. Okay, so traffic flow management, the basic idea, the input to the traffic flow management is the traffic demand. And you have flow constraints like airport capacity, airspace capacity. And the objective of this optimization is to uh, uh, maximize throughput, minimize delays, distribute delays equitably, and also include user preference. So the traffic flow control is you, you, you can impose ground delay, you can do miles in trail. So miles in trail means that two aircraft are separated by let's say five miles or 10 miles. And then minutes in trail is that the leading aircraft, the, uh, the following aircraft is separated from the leading aircraft by five minutes or 10 minutes. That's like miles in trail. And you can reroute, so the, you can change, or you can hold the, you can put the airplane on a hold so that the airplane is actually spinning around till you actually let it continue on its route. So these are the control mechanisms that are frequently used in air traffic, traffic flow management. So this is an example of winds. So this is, uh, you, you can, it can be pretty high. So you can even have areas where the winds are like 100 to 120 knots, 60 to 65 knots. So, it, so, weather, so wind information is important for predicting where the airplane will, will be. So for example, if the airplane is flying a certain airspeed and it gets a tailwind, then the ground speed will be faster. So for separation assurance, you have to do it based on ground speed, not airspeed. So that, that is the uh, reference that you use for conflict detection and resolution. So wind, uh, wind uh, data is very important, right? Um, so that is another data source uh, that causes uh, data science problems, right? And then you have weather. So this is collaborative convective uh, forecast product. So this is showing you severe weather, so you have uh, you have you know regions which are green you have regions which are yellow you have regions which are red and basically you cannot fly through some of these areas and not only that you have to also maintain some distance from these regions because there is turbulence uh, around these areas so now if you think about this as an image you can also imagine how you could how how you could apply image processing kind of techniques to figure out what regions are um, uh, you know, you can, so for example, you can use something like a blob, uh, blob col coloring algorithm to fill in the gaps where the airplane cannot pass. So basically, you can grow them into bigger regions and then eventually, you know, think of them as obstacles around which your route has to go. Okay, so TFM rerouting. So there's something called playbook routes, which are in the system. And playbook routes are canned routes, which are uh, you know which the air traffic control has. So those are documented. This is an old route; it does not exist anymore, but it's it's still a good example. So here uh, there was a route called West Waterton Playbook Route, and that goes through the Minneapolis Center. Uh, you see the highlighted region. So basically, uh, the, you know, if, if you take off from Los Angeles, you would go through Bryce Canyon and then wrap and then go through Aberdeen and then essentially go through the Minneapolis Center and then go through IID. So this playbook route is designed to, uh, to go around weather, around uh, the weather in the uh, Minneapolis Center, for example. So here is a UAL 180 flight. That was the flight plan actually went through that area of um, severe weather. So basically the air traffic control uses the playbook route to reroute him around this region of weather, right? Okay, now when they try to reroute, so this is sector 16 and 17, when they try to reroute around sectors, uh, through sectors 16, the, the traffic count, in, uh, the instantaneous traffic count in sec, sec, sector 16 goes over that, uh, over the value that the controller can handle. So essentially you, 
they cannot go through this. So you require a local reroute to go around uh, sector 16. So this shows uh, American airline kind of going around sector 16 so that the, uh, so, so that sector 16 is not congested. So by this example, all we are showing is that, you know, just the rerouting doesn't work sometimes. On top of rerouting, you have to use other initiatives. So in this case, it says that originally, you know, at 10 minutes, so this basically shows an hour long forecast. So at 10 minutes, you would have the sector count would exceed in sector uh, 16 and the maximum number of aircraft that you can have in that sector is 18. So when you apply a playbook route, the, uh, the, the, the air traffic, the number of aircraft in sector 16 in, exceeds 18 at some point in time. So you have to apply miles and trail on top of that uh, at Aberdeen. So you are saying 20 miles and trail. That's the other constraint you do. And then you apply a local reroute. And when you do the local reroute, everything kind of balances out. So you can see that everything is green and basically the controller would not be overwhelmed. This one shows that if you just did a local reroute and you did not imply impose miles and trail constraint, the, the, you would solve the problem in sector 16, but sector 17, the, the monitor alert parameter, which is the work measure of the workload of the controller, that would get exceeded. So, so this shows that you have to apply multiple controls to manage the, uh, the traffic flow. Okay, so to end my talk, I basically described the national airspace system. I talked about the air traffic control facilities. I talked about air traffic control equipment. I talked about aircraft, uh, air traffic controller roles and responsibilities. I talked about regulations and directives. I talked about separation assurance. I talked about traffic flow management. And from the ATM data science, uh, from the ATM data for data science, I talked about air, airspace geometry data. I talked about flight plan data. I talked about surveillance data. And I talked about wind and weather data. Thank you so much for being patient. Thanks so much, Gana. That was fantastic. Um, very informative for everyone. Um, are there any questions for Ghana? Uh, can we get the slides? Can we get all the information <laughs> to store? I mean, this is a really good, uh, it, it couldn't be published as a book. <laughs> I think uh, Gano can um, definitely send out the slides at some point. Gano, can you, can you respond yeah. to that? Okay, yeah. yeah. So basically these are, uh, you know, these have been approved by NASA. So NASA has agreed to put it in public domain, right? So I, I can provide it. Thank you. I think they get posted on the website, on the, on the data sciences website too. Yes. Yeah, the, the presentation itself will, will definitely be posted, the recording. And then maybe the, the slides themselves can be also. Uh, I think this should have been a two hour session. <laughs> <laughs> so Shagata, you want me to work more? <laughs> oh, definitely. This is actually very good. I really like it. Yeah, I skipped over a lot of things, but you know, it, it, if, if I went into details, it would uh, take longer. And, uh, I, I have a quick suggestion. Gone it's, a, it's a perfect one hour view of uh, the whole ecosystem, which is extremely insightful for a person like me, you know, <laughs> who likes to do his favorite drone and UAM stuff, but is very often not uh, fully aware of the bigger picture. So thank you. Thank you, Raja. Yeah. He, I have a quick request, Gano. I don't know if we can do it for everyone, but at least for internal folks, you know, uh, I would, it would be nice to have another follow-up presentation about detailed of applications. Like, you know, what all kind of a summary of all the, the application work that has happened at NASA, for example, with data science and aviation, right? Um, yeah, just, just an idea. So Berkeley is planning a, a, a course for that, right? 
<laughs> yes, Berkeley is planning a course. I don't mean Raja can fill the class more on that. Um, but yeah, that could be another platform for that. Great. Um, are there any other questions from any of the um, participants? Okay, then I think uh, we can give a virtual applause to Gano. Thanks so much for presenting. This was fantastic. Thank you, Gano. And, thank you, thank um, you. You're welcome. And Hi, this uh, is Bonavar. As, oh, Bonavar, yes. Uh, do you have a Hello. question? Hello. Yeah. Hey, Bonavar. Hello? Hey, Bonavar, go ahead. We can hear you. Oh, maybe he can't hear us. <laughs> oh, <laughs> maybe he muted himself. I don't know. Yeah. Hello. Maybe he can. Yeah. Bonover. Hey, Bonover, go ahead. Hey, uh, Gano, a lot of this stuff uh, we had written uh, in a something called air, aircraft technologies. So if, if somebody is looking for a written part of it, um, some, some of these stuff is uh, in that but you have added a lot of new stuff to it. Well, Bonover, yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I, I um, forgot about it. This is the... Um, the uh, it's in one of is, the encyclopedias. This, yeah, this is the John Wiley. Yeah. Uh, is it Wiley? Yeah, it's Wiley. It's called yeah. the... Um, I think it's called Aircraft Technologies. It's, I, I, have that, I have that paper I can actually... Yeah. That, would, that would give a you know, a lot of the detail for what you're saying, but you have a lot more stuff here, so. Yeah, so that, that paper kind of talks about air traffic control and uh, it, it even talks about the different types of additional equipment and uh, yeah, so that's a good article, I think, yeah. Well, okay, okay. thank you everyone for joining us. Great. Um, um, as uh, as we were mentioning earlier uh, before the talk, um, next week will be our final seminar for the semester. We do obviously uh, appreciate everyone's patience as we can't went through the semester. Um, and for those of you who are taking the course, please uh, stay tuned next week for the assignment details. Um, and with that, we hope to see everyone next week for the final presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.